Hi and welcome to the vlog. I'm David, this is an Englishman in the Balkans. I had planned uh, for this video for this week to be a chat with me and Christoph Baumgarten from balkanstories.net. He's uh, an Austrian blogger, speaks excellent English by the way, but he's got this cool blog and we've been interacting over the last couple of years and I just was waiting for the opportunity for him to be in the region, for me to be here at the same time and we could just meet up. Well, it's just happened. He uh, dropped into Banja Luka for an evening and I thought, this is great. I'll do a podcast and I'll vlog it as well, except that the camera died at 16 minutes into the recording. Well, the audio part uh, went for the full interview and you can listen to that on SoundCloud. I put a link um, below, but I thought I'll give you the 16 minutes that we managed to record um, before the camera died. It's very, very interesting. It's uh, another guy's perspective of the Balkans, somebody that is not born here. So uh, I hope that um, you enjoy it. And um, well, here it is, us sat in the Yovo Bar or outside the Yovo Bar in the center of Banja Luka. We're sat today in, um, in a coffee bar in Banja Luka. Um, and, you know, being an Englishman in the Balkans, sometimes you feel that you're the only foreigner that is um, in Banja Luka. Having said that, there are, there are about five others, four of which are Brits. So I'm not totally alone. But today I've caught up with um, Christoph Baumgartner. Christoph uh, is going to tell us anyway, but I think comes from Bech, which is Vienna. Mm -hmm. um, he's also a journalist, and he runs this amazing blog called BalkanStories.net. We're going to talk about that as well. So let's do it properly uh, and find out a little bit about why uh, an Austrian has an obsession with the Balkans. So why the Balkans for an Austrian? I guess I've always had friends from down here. Um, like when I was in kindergarten, I had like a playmate that was from what was back then Yugoslavia uh, in primary school and, and, and later on you know, when I moved to, to Vienna, I've always lived in, in, in areas that are mainly proletarian, mainly migrant. And to think that one, of, one out of every 10 Viennese does have roots in, in former Yugoslavia. And we're just talking first and second generation. Uh, so, you know, at some point in time in my life, I just decided to, to find out, you know, where all these friends of mine come from and, and what their background is and, and why to... Um, the horrible things that happened 20 years ago or 25 years ago now could happen because that was also when one thing when, when, when I grew up that we, we uh, that my mother uh, uh, took care of, of a couple of refugees from, from Bosnia and Croatia so, so that also was, was something um, and it slowly developed into to a passion I, yeah let's call it a passion you're a journalist, um, but you blog, and you might say, well, blogging is a natural extension for a journalist, but it seems, uh, as things develop in the digital world, that bloggers are becoming their own sort of genre, their own sort of DNA um, within the internet, and not conforming to the normal rules of accepted journalism. What would you say you are primarily? Are you still a journalist, or, or do you see yourself as, as time goes on, becoming more of a blogger? I would say that I'm still mainly a journalist, but, but I'm, I'm trying to, to, to cover long abandoned tradition of subjective yet neutral journalism. Um, like, if you look at journalistic works of, of Ernest Hemingway, for instance, he did that, or his... Austrian Czech counterpart uh, Egon Evan Kish, who did that a lot, and and, and those are journalists that, that have inspired me a lot. And and I would would actually call them the the if you will the grandfathers of, of journalistic blogging. So 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 really to to do stuff at your own time, uh, at your own pace, and at your own length, which is what I love about my blog. I can do what I want. Uh, I still try to, to adhere to journalistic standards, and I think I do a better job than actually a lot of professional journalists do on their paid jobs. 
but uh, it enables me to, to give my individual perspective while, while still trying to, to be neutral, if you will. How difficult has it been to set up a, a blog? I mean, people think it's you know pretty easy. You hook onto WordPress and you start churning out content without any discipline, without, without any real care. How difficult has it been to, to establish Balkan stories, to have, like, it's got a considerable readership um, and, and a whole breadth of stories? Um, well, I thought it was easier than it turned out to be, like, like many people. Uh, um, luckily, I've, I've got a lot of routine and, 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 and writing and, and discipline writing also, so that did help a lot. But, uh, one of the things that I underestimated was the need for images, for instance. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm still trying to, to get good at is, um, let's call it self-marketing, because I think there would be a lot more people interested in, in, in reading my stories uh, than are currently reading them. When you, when you get responses, for me in particular, People are more interested in the, the darker, the more unpleasant side of the former Yugoslavia, uh, the Bosnia-Herzegovina, the Serbia, the Croatia, the Montenegro of today, rather than the positive things. Um, what's your experience dealing with that? Actually, I think I do get more response for positive stories, actually. I mean, I'm, I, I do try to, to, to cover both ends, but, but both ends from, from an angle you wouldn't normally have have any place for in in, in standard media or or I, I would like to avoid the term mainstream media because it it sounds a bit hostile now and and it's being abused by a lot of people who want to spin a conspiracy theories um, so you know let's let's say uh, for instance I discover a Facebook video with a very, very nice Bosnian joke, and I'm so proud that I understood enough of the language to get the point of, of, of that video, of, of that joke, uh, and I posted that online, and people were like, yeah, great, you did that, uh, and yeah, finally, some somebody did that, uh, not, notwithstanding the fact that, that of course, I only had a fraction of, of people watching it on, on my blog compared to, to, to the Facebook page, which I think was, I think there the, the video was watched half a million times or, or even more than that. And that was just a simple thing to do. I mean, it took me 10 minutes maybe, you know, asking the guy who posted it on his Facebook page if, if I could use it. And he was like, okay with it. And then, you know, write the text around it just a few lines. I mean, that is a, a video that's self-explaining to, to everybody who, who speaks the language, so, you know, waste no time about it. And, and, and you know, that was very encouraging to, to see that, that I made people smile. Uh, I love to do that, of course. Uh, but, but also, like, on, on more negative stories that I do, sometimes I do get response, and that also is encouraging, because I, most of the time, I try to, to cover those angles that are frequently overlooked by by uh, Western media. I try to cover the poverty one encounters here, the open poverty, uh, for instance, uh, and that also does at least occasionally get some response and, and, and I have people tell me, thank you for telling that story because it needed to be told. People should take a closer look here. You get lots of unique stories as well. One in particular that has always stuck in my mind was, I thought, you know, where the heck did Christoph find the story about uh, drinking for peace, about craft beer? Uh, it was such an amazing story. You can check it out on the blog. Um, it, it was wonderful. So where do you get these really offbeat stories from? That was pure luck. Actually, the guys who, who initiated the project emailed me if I didn't want to write a story about them. That, so, so that was that was really pure luck, and, and I do get that occasionally too. Like like authors uh, uh, writing to me, don't you want to do a re review of my book, or don't you want to cover that? Uh, there's also a story I think 
I could be doing for you, or should be doing actually for you, I need to have it translated. A friend of mine, a uh, Bosnian-Austrian, uh, has published an all-comprehensive traveler's guide to yes, Bosnia. Yes, 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 yes. Tell, uh, tell us about it. Uh, so, so Amel uh, is totally unsatisfied with, with how Bosnia is, is represented internationally as, as a tourism destination, so he decided to, to write his own book with destinations that he went to. And I think it's it's like the traveler's guide with the most destinations in it, actually. And, you know, he, he doesn't write a lot about history, perhaps, but, but just about the beauty of the country and what to do when you're in a certain place. And um, it has lots of images in it, and it's very comprehensive. And I think it's been published in five languages so far. Um, Bosnian, or the language formerly known as, as Serbo Croatian or a language without name, yeah. wh whatever you want to call it. Yeah, we always have that problem. <laughs> um, German, Turkish, English, and I think Italian. That's amazing. Hey, you you come here twice twice a year, and we were talking before we, we, we started this discussion about um, the problem that we, we perceive as being a problem for the country that you know, everything gravitates to Sarajevo in the first instance, and then in the second instance it gravitates to Mostar. We're sat in a coffee bar in Banja Luka at the moment, um, which I have ve rarely, rarely seen on any tour um, itinerary, but yet there's, there's a lot of history here, there's a lot of culture that seems to get lost. I have this impression that there, there's going, you know, there are black holes of information in the Balkans. What's your view on that? Well, Definitely, and, and, and saying that, like like being as, as somebody who has come to regard Sarajevo as a second home, actually. Um, you know, it is through friends here that I find out about stuff to do and, and to visit mainly. Um, and I'm, I'm lucky to, to have these friends. Um, it's, you know, for, for us in, in the West, it's mostly cliche and then... And you've got a couple of traveler's guides with outdated infos. And this doesn't solely concern Bosnia, by the way. Uh, and then you're stuck in a place uh, and you're wondering what to do. When, when you don't have anybody who knows the place around here, you're bored to death. And that is sad because it is very hard to find good info on on what to do when, when, for instance, you want to travel to Bosnia and, and try to be off the beaten path, perhaps a bit. Mostar is a beautiful city, but if you've been there once, I think it's enough. You know, unless you get good friends there, you know, you don't want to bump into all those tourists. Sarajevo is great if, you know, like, the corners of the town uh, are usually not in the spotlights. Uh, Banja Luka... I don't know enough about, but Banja Luka uh, has me fascinated with this mix of architectures, for instance. You never read about that, or at least I don't recall ever reading about it. Just doesn't, you know, it just doesn't exist. And, and so I think it, it would be a very good thing for, for Bosnia to understand itself as a, as a country as a united country and to promote tourism and to perhaps get some comprehensive traveler's guides published. That would be a good start. Let's go back to Sarajevo for, for, for a second. And, um, you know, when you go to Sarajevo, they, they say, oh, you can go in the city center and you'll see a mosque and you'll see an Orthodox church and you'll see a Christian church and you can go and visit them all. And, and is, isn't this a wonder? How the heck did you find the synagogue? Um, well, that was in a traveler's guide, actually, for once. But, but you know, you really, you really have to leave through this. Uh, and, and, and there are two, actually, one, one of which is a museum. And that one's better described in the uh, in a traveler's guide. And the other one, uh, I passed by, actually looking for something else, and then I passed it by and I th thought, didn't I read something about this building in a traveler's guide? It must be a synagogue. And then, then, then I wander into there, expecting heavy security checks, as is customs in, in, in Austria, because 
well, you know, we do have neo-Nazi anti-Semites, we do have a couple of Islamistic anti-Semites, so, well, there are some serious security issues for, for the synagogue in, in Vienna. And nobody asks me, asks me for an ID, it's, it's just a friendly young girl working there asking me whether I want a guided tour through the synagogue. Uh, then there is the cafeteria I can go to openly with, with a couple of people just hanging out just normally, everybody happy, I'm, I'm there, very welcoming. And, and after the tour, I get invited to, to, um, to Shabbat prayer, which was a, a great experience, even for me not being a religious person. But the best thing of, of them all in the cafeteria there, the cafeteria is, I think, the only place in all of Sarajevo that calls Turkish coffee still Turkish coffee. It's Every, domestic elsewhere, isn't it? Right, right, right. It's 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 too much a cup of domestic coffee, which uh, uh, Balkan Kafane in, in Vienna uh, also sell it as as domestic uh, coffee, and there is nothing domestic about it in Vienna, but they still use the term. You know, what we should do, I think, in the future is you know reserve a weekend, and and, and the two of us should do, you know, uh, the off the track. Um, Banyaluka. What do you actually look for, though, when you when you go to somewhere in the country that you've never been before? Is there a sort of plan that you have? Do you start with architecture, or do you start with religion, or do you start with food? You know, what is your plan? Um, I'm always trying to, to go to places to meet people, to to talk to people. Um, that is what interests me the most. Sometimes you're not as lucky as as you hope you were. Uh, and of course, sometimes when, when you go to specific places, you do have places in mind that you desperately want to see. Uh, but, but mainly for, for me, it's like, okay, you know, um, I, I came to Banyaluka for the first time to, to see uh, uh, the, I think here it's called Narodny Museum. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Just over oh, there, the night of the museum, yeah. Um, and, and, and the Museum of, of Republika Zrebska to, to, to take a look at, at the, the reconstruction or to some degree rewriting of, of, of and that's where it all went uh, and the recording like suddenly stopped but as i said uh, earlier on in the video there's a link to the soundcloud um, podcast below and you can listen to the other i think 13 minutes of uh, gold dust as i like to call it from christoph baumgarten well that's it for this week we'll be back next sunday with a new video uh, I've got some plans, some more plans coming on. I hope you're enjoying the content at the moment. Please comment and let me know whether it's good or bad, what you want to see change, and if it's possible, we'll do it. Like, share, and subscribe. That always, always helps. Uh, I've demonetized the channel, so hopefully you're not getting too many ads to upset your viewing pleasure. Until next week, uh, I'm in the uh, office today, by the way. Uh, it's really hot outside and I'm waiting to get my air conditioned service so that's why I'm not out in the blazing sun because like it messes up my complexion. Anyway, enough of that uh, and we'll see you next week. Stay safe.